So our next speaker is uh, Les Posen, who's come maybe among the farthest away from all of you, although many of you have come from a long distance, from Melbourne, Australia, who has been uh, working with virtual reality now for really 17 years. And he's going to talk about his experiences as a psychologist using virtual reality sort of in the clinical trenches and a lot of the, uh, what he's learned about doing that, both with children and with adults, and there's a real emphasis on using it, um, uh, as you'll hear, um, for various anxieties, like, uh, like, like, like flying on a plane and so forth. So uh, we got it up there, excellent. So thank you for flying across the ocean and being with us, and look forward to your comments today. Thanks, Brennan. That looks like it's working, what do you think? It does. Thanks, Brent, for inviting me over. Thanks for uh, your team to help being set up. We're Fingers crossed that the sound works, technology works. So I've been working in uh, VR for, as Brendan said, for some 17 years. So I'm going to share with you some of the things that I've learned to pass on to you. Some of you will recognize this as the Gartner hype cycle for technology. It starts on the bottom left, and as we go up, we get to this peak of inflated expectations with new technologies. Often, technologies overpromise and they underdeliver. And when they underdeliver, we fall into what's called the trough of disillusionment, or the trough of disappointment. And I think VR has been there three, four, five times since it started many years. Walter's going, yes, yes, I know that. And Skip over there, yes, yes, he's nodding. So trough of disillusionment. But if we're lucky, maybe this time we'll come out of it. Maybe this time we'll come out of it, now that we've entered the world of medicine and VR, and uh, we'll enter what's called the slope of enlightenment in technical terms, uh, that might lead to the plateau of productivity. In, in VR terms, in, in, in terms of medicine and psychology, uh, let's change it to the slope of acceptance, that this is a reasonable thing to be doing as part of our work, and then it's actually a normal workflow. We're going to include this in our normal work as we go along. Does that make sense? So here's Steven Spielberg. He's probably our number one master storyteller after Hitchcock. And so I'm going to tell my story as a story. And stories have beginnings, middles, and ends. And my story begins in 1974. That's not when I was born. It's when I started my first year of studies at Monash University in Melbourne, 1974. I had a vague idea to become a psychologist, didn't know what one did. But what I discovered, in fact, that Monash was known as, for, as a rats and stats university. It wasn't clinical psychology at all. It was very much about churning out research scientists, quantitative psychologists. Those of us in first year who didn't want to do that, we wanted to be clinical psychologists, they all just dropped out and went somewhere else. I stayed with the program. And my first lecturer was the head of department, Ross Day. And Ross Day wanted to see psychology as a science. And when he was interviewed a few years back, he said, uh, in an interview, he said, this. I insisted that psychology should be treated as an experimental discipline and funded in the same way as chemistry. He saw it as a science. And so all his work was as science. He said, if you mention psychoanalysis in my lab, you're chucked out of the university. Nothing to do with it. And uh, later on, I discovered that he did all sorts of interesting experiments. I was actually the rat. I did the experiments, being a first year. And the experiments like this, and you were asked which of the so the, the circles is closer and further. Ross was interested in motion. He was interested in illusions, interested in depth perception. He'd done that for many, many years. And he, then he'd changed things and introduced gradients. Now, which one's in front and which one's behind? And we had to select left one or right one. And then things that are closer to you at the same size tend to move faster in front of your visual field. So you get a clue that maybe the one that went faster was in front of you, as long as those two things were the same size we brought mental set, as it's called, to this. And I was introduced to these two concepts that come from philosophy and from linguistics, known as veridicality and verisimilitude, long words, starting with V. In fact, they start with these terms, very, and it's verus, Latin, means truth. And tonight, when we go out for a drink, we will discover in vino veritas, <laughs> some of us anyway. So it's about truth, it's the, or as Stephen Colbert will say, it's the truthiness of what's around us. It's what we bring to things, it's what, or if you're a Talmudic scholar, since we're at the Cedar Sana, if you're a Talmudic scholar, it said, we don't see the world as it is, we see it as we are. 
It's what we bring to the world, the things that we carry around in our head that we project onto the world to help us make sense of things. In the VR world, we kind of refer to this as immersion and presence, but it's not quite the same. It's similar. So if you're a surgeon here at Cedar sinai and you're watching a new show called The Resident or The Good Doctor, and there's a procedural error in an operation because the scriptwriter got something wrong, you would say that that show lacks verisimilitude. But you may still be immersed in the program. Does that make sense? That's verisimilitude. It's a very important concept that I learned many years ago. He also studied illusions. I've always been fascinated by illusions. This is one of the oldest ones that exists, 1889. And the idea is which is the line which is longer, and of course they're the same length. But we are fooled by the arrows. And even when we see this, we are still somewhat fooled. Can you see this? Yeah, okay. So he played with them with these sort of illusions, and he learned that we fill in the dots. One of the oldest illusions, we fill in the dots. Our brains work in such ways that they take shortcuts. There's too much going on around us to individually label it, so we take shortcuts, and, and sometimes we just fill in the dots. With the anxious patients that I see, they fill in the dots all the time, seeing things which they choose to be fearful of, and sometimes they don't choose at all, and they make the connection very quickly that I need to be afraid of this, and therefore take action, which is either to escape and flee, or freeze on the spot. So far, so good? Let's keep going. A couple of other illusions he played with. He looked at gradients and contrast. I think you'll agree that these are all the same hue of grey. And he passed a, uh, something behind and noticed the one on the right seems to now be a lighter colour than the ones on the left because this gradient contrast. I'll remove it and guess what happens? Bang. You know that they're the same colour and yet look what happens. I'll do it even more slowly. So try not to let it happen and you can see what happens. And this is what happens for some of our anxious patients when they go into situations where previously they have felt certain sensations or had certain thoughts or behaved a certain way. This is the mental set that they approach things with. Very good. And of course, this for some people is just a bunch of dots. And if you live in a world that does not have dogs, even when they're in motion, you won't see a dog. So these are the sort of things that we were playing around with in 1974. This is a, a gestalt, if you like. And what about this one? He's very interested in something called the Ames Room. Again, what we bring to things, the notions that we have, that things have perceptual constancy, they don't change. So in this room, if you look through it with one eye, something very strange. These are twin girls. Watch what happens. This is not CGI, but she becomes a giant. And what, in fact, this is, is a distorted room where the area on the far left is much further away. But, of course, all the furniture has been changed in size to give us the appearance through one eye that it's the same size. It's very compelling. This is not CGI. This is the Ames room. He studied this as well. Moving along. One of the things he did was look at aviation, and he became world famous for constructing those lights on the right-hand side, which is known as a precision approach path indicator. Let me show you. If you've got the two reds and two whites, you're on the three degree glide slope. If you're too high, you're going to land too far down. They went white, and if you're too low, they were in red. Why red? We have twice as many red cones in our retina. Red is a symbol of both alarm and attraction. Do you want to be too high or too low and get alarmed? Too low alarm, because you're going to run short. Too high, you can take off and go elsewhere. So that's the sort of stuff he did. And I didn't understand his aviation stuff, and I didn't understand the, the importance of his work until 1979 and after. Air New Zealand at the time was running a series of flights down to Antarctica, sightseeing flights. This is the most advanced aircraft in the world at the time. In 1979, after several hours away on November, it didn't come back. And after they were sure that the, flight, that the fuel reserves were gone, they sent out research, uh, search teams from McMurdo Sound, a US naval base. And unfortunately, uh, they discovered a problem. This was the intended path, looping around near, near Antarctica, sightseeing trip. But when it didn't come back and the search team went out, this is what they found, with 260 people having lost their lives and the aircraft in full power. 
when they recovered the black box and the flight recorders, they had heard the go up, go up, or pull up, pull up from the radio altimeter, and full power was applied automatically by the trained pilots, and they slammed into Mount Erebus at 1,500 feet, to which we're entitled to ask, how does this happen on the most sophisticated aircraft with a mountain that's 16,000 foot in front of you? Well, as it turns out, an error had lain in the system, the navigation department at New Zealand. The night before, it was corrected by the chief navigator. It was a tiny, tiny error, and he corrected it. But when he corrected it, he entered a typo, didn't tell the pilots he'd done the correction, and it moved the flight path from there straight to Mount Erebus, to which you're now entitled to ask, but hold on, how come they didn't see the mountain? It's 16,000 foot. And if you're a polar explorer, you know the reason why. And the reason is there's a condition known as whiteout, where have cloud suddenly comes down in front of a mountainous region with a certain amount of polar light behind, you lose depth perception and contrast. And this is where Ross Day's research helped to break open this case. And I need to read you this. This is the result of the Royal Commissioner. In the result, Professor Day, my professor, recognised the whiteout phenomenon might account for the failure to ascertain the presence of rising terrain, the mountain. He placed great emphasis on the briefing that they had, that that is the mental set, this is what you should expect to see, the mental set, which was a systems failure because they didn't tell him, tell them we've moved at 20 miles. And the failure of the flight crew to ascertain that the white expanse in front of them was not a flat plane as it seemed to be. They had specialists there in Antarctic exploration, and they kind of looked out and think, hmm, there wasn't s sufficient disverisimilitude to say we're not where we're supposed to be. Because they thought we were meant to be here, they saw what they thought they were meant to see. Do you see where we're going with this? And they were convinced. And here's one situation where it's not fun. It costs lives, this idea of mental set. And all five of them were confused on the flight deck. So let's move a little bit further forward. In 1989, middle of my story, I decided, no, I think I do want to become a clinical psychologist, and I joined Melbourne's Austin Hospital, a bit like you'll see the Sinai here. And my, Reese, my supervisor at the time is this woman, not the best picture I found, Ida Kaplan, who's now working for um, victims of, ref of uh, refugees and torture. Australia has a problem of people coming to Australia. We don't know where they're from, and our past governments have been rather unhumanitarian in their treatment of them, put them on islands known as Nauru and Manus Island in New Guinea, and she goes there and supervises and measures and assesses and treats. But at the time in 1989, she was my supervisor, but she was also running the Fear of Flying program for this airline. Uh, what ANSET is to uh, United, its opponent Qantas is to Delta. It's, it was a major player in the field, and she ran this Fear of Flying program. Uh, and um, in 1994, having graduated and spent some time working with severe victims of PTSD, bushfires, murder and so forth, she invited me back to apply my clinical skills and take over the program, running the, the ANSET fear flying course for the next uh, seven years or so. And so I really got my hands into exposure work in the treatment of anxiety. We held these programs at the airport, gate one, where the planes would come along. And this is where I learned the importance, not just of visuals, but of haptics and audio, because people would often say, it's so hard for me to just be here at the airport, because you've, you would feel the whole place vibrate when the aircraft took off, or the engine started up, and you would smell the avgas, what you would call, uh, what we call kerosene, the English call paraffin, but Jet A1 fuel, it's very powerful as a mental set preparation. So I ran that for, until the year 2000, and during this time, aviation became very safe much safer than it was previously, and I wanted to include much more psychology into the program, but the company said, no, let's keep it as an aviation-based program, so we parted ways. And so I went into the wilderness of thinking, how am I going to apply my technical skills? How am I going to help people be exposed when I can't get them on aircraft anymore? Does that work for you as an idea? Yeah? So what was the priority at the time? Well, Apart from exposure, we had to find another way to do exposure, and so the one that was most popular was something called imaginal exposure where you ask the patient, please imagine being on or in your scary situation, yeah? I discovered it wasn't a particularly good thing. It was the best we had. Because what would happen in certain situations, you'd ask the patient, close your eyes. This is the best way I could do, make this guy close up, put some studies on him. And then ask him to imagine his scary situation.
this is pretty scary. But this is normal. It's the approach into San Francisco until separation loss occurs, something kind of weird happens. Do you feel, feel a little bit of apprehension just watching this? So imagine this guy closes his eyes and thinks about this experience which brings him into his work with me. What we discovered, what I discovered was if it got too strong, he would bug out. Some of them were too concrete, couldn't get into it at all. There was insufficient arousal to do any good clinical work. Okay? So maybe he bugs out and he thinks about his family. <sighs> That's a safe place to go to. One of the outcomes of anxiety is people seek safe places, avoidance in safe places. So maybe he thinks about his family, but then a thought comes in, oh my God, what happens if they're on the plane with me? That's a terrible thought. I'm still anxious, so he says, I'm going to go, where am I going to go? So up from nowhere comes one of his first thoughts of when he was aroused. Oh, so I can go back and capture that. Maybe it didn't work. Do it one more time. Plane, skip. Fingers crossed. No. Uh, what, what you were going to see was a picture of Belle de Jour with Catherine Deneuve in her naked role. How many of you know Catherine Deneuve, naked role? The joke was going to be, it's not Storby Daniels, but never mind, we'll get there another time. <laughs> blonde and she's naked and this is where he goes. So I felt no emotional exposure has its limits and then fortunately for me within that same year virtually better came along. This was their, um, if I just go back one slide, this is their original 2001 slide, looks like a 2001 slide doesn't it? Um, and they were offering virtually virtual reality for what I want to do here. The originators, Barbara, specialist in, P in uh, PTSD and Larry uh, and I bought their system, it was $5,000 and uh, I had to set it up myself because uh, unlike a turnkey system that they were offering, um, I had to do it all in Australia. I had to source it all myself and build it myself. Look at that powerful Dell 500 megahertz machine that they made and the, the 35 field degree field of view. We're now doing 100 on headsets. And look at the uh, resolution. But you know what? It was effective. Why? Because as a therapist, I think I was able to help them create the mental set of what's going on. And I really emphasized the audio and the haptics, the vibrations. And so here's the setup. This is my current setup using real seats so people walk in and already the exposure work begins. Many patients say, just looking at those seats, I'm starting to get anxious. The flip side, of course, is this guy must know what he's doing because he's got these seats in his room. Don't, don't negate authority of practitioner as being an important component. Um, it, I now use a Mac, not a Windows machine. I create a little bit of work there. And there's a, you can't quite see it, but there's a Samsung there. Um, but underneath the, uh, where the seats are sitting are these Aura Bass Shaker speakers to include vibrations. Do not underestimate haptics or tactile stimulation. Uh, and then uh, we did a little TV program. The news caught up with me, 2001. Let's have a look. It's ahead an early morning emergency at a metropolitan service station and the virtual way to confront your fears. For the thousands of Australians living with phobias, treatment is often a long and difficult process. But now, state-of-the-art technology is helping people confront their fears. More from Matt Dowling. Ian Collins' fear of flying was once so bad he didn't board a plane for 14 years. Now he returns to the skies from the security of a psychologist's office. Ian, yeah, you're in the cabin now of our 737. Les Posen is using virtual reality therapy to help people conquer their phobias, putting the client in the situation, in Ian's case, on board an aircraft where anxiety sometimes takes over. The seats are equipped to simulate every situation, from takeoff to mid-air turbulence. The most important thing with any sort of virtual therapy is to leave people long enough in the environment so they experience a reduction of their anxiety. And I've got complete control over that environment. Ian admits it was unpleasantly realistic. The, the bumps and bangs of the wheels, um, the noise of the engines and the actual vibration in the seat here are all, you know, you think you're on a plane. This technology can also be used by people who fear heights, storms 
and public speaking, where the audience response can range from appreciative. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. To downright hostile. Get off. Get Dude, off. You're hopeless. Yeah, hopeless. Yeah. Matt Dowling, National 9 News. So Anthony that last <laughs> joins me now with sport. Thanks. That last part was the, uh, the TV crew having a bit of fun with this. Did you notice what he said? He didn't refer to the visuals. He referred to the haptics and the sounds. So those of you in development, do not leave that stuff out. It's extremely important to create that sense of emotion. I worked very hard to do this here. Uh, you also may have noticed he was wearing on his fingers some sensory data stuff. I was doing biofeedback in 2001. I've now shifted from GSR. I, it's interesting, but I don't think it's a, it's, it's a good enough granular indicator, and I'm now using what Ben was referring to as heart rate variability measures. The ability of the parasympathetic system via the vagal nerve or the vagal system to be able to contain the arousal that occurs under sympathetic stress. Yeah, well, I think we're going to be talking a lot more about this as time goes on. So that's what I'm using now. When people see that actually you're able to control some that felt was out of their control, heart rate or change of heart rate, it's a very, very compelling experience. Moving on. You may have heard me talk before about leaving people long enough in their scary situations so they experience a, a, a decrease of arousal. This is David Eagleman, who was firmly, formerly at Baylor, now at Stanford. And there's a documentary I show to people from the Navy about the Navy SEALs and how they train to overcome their fear responses. And this helps to set up why we're going to do exposure and why we're going to do VR as that source of exposure. And he's going to talk about the two things that is the right way to do training that I emulate and, and patients here. No, we're not going to hear it. Go back one step. Okay, so he talks about the right way to do training is expose people to their scary situations long enough until they feel a, a reduction. Most people leave their scary situations and seek safety and therefore relief. And the stronger they do that, the earlier they do that, the more relief they feel, the more they reverse engineer a fear response to what may have been a benign stimulus. So many times people say to me, I used to love flying and now I can't stand it. And what's happened is that over time, they've trained themselves to react earlier to lesser signals by escaping earlier. So the longer we can help people stay in their scary situations, sometimes you've got to titrate the experience. The problem with certain experiences that people do is they take too long, you want to do it fairly quickly and rapidly. Don't take too much time, get into it pretty quickly. So exposure, also known in the trade as habituation. But there's one other thing that we want to do, and that's knowing what to do different. So in a person with turbulence, rather than squeezing on the seats, which of course only increases blood pressure, sympathetic arousal, decreased vagal tone, you have people do different things. Distraction is okay, but only it has a very limited place in anxiety work. So knowing what to do is also known, by the way, is inhibitory learning. You're trying to inhibit the old learning and replace with new learning. Two things that need to work together, habituation and new learning. So we've talked a little bit about distraction and focus. There is a place for distraction, but what I'm trying to do is help people focus on the unpleasant sensations and learn to tolerate them. People who are anxious make two fundamental errors. Two fundamental errors. And it's about probability testing. Here are the two errors that we work on. One is an overestimation of the presence of danger. They switch on very early. Their thoughts shift in nature to more catastrophic ones, which are then accompanied by sensations in the system. And people then interpret those sensations as evidence that the thought must be true, when in fact the sensations are due to the presence of those thoughts. So we call this emotional reasoning, and we have to help people make that separation. That's the inhibitory learning part. The second part is an underestimation of their ability to cope. So rather than saying, I can't stand it, it'll be terrible, what's going to happen to me? It's about teaching people, this is where the cognitive therapy comes in, the ability to reappraise the situation, reappraise their ability to cope. Breathing is very helpful to reducing the sympathetic arousal and cognitive reappraisal or cognitive restructuring. That requires practice, and here's the beauty of the VR, that we can stay in VR and watch these changes happen. Watch them happening physiologically. 
people can see and feel for themselves. Why? Because we do three or four different takeoffs, not just airplanes, but elevators and whatever else. And they know that the only thing that's changing is their response due to what they're doing, not what I'm doing to the computer. Does that make sense? It's their activity. They're the one who are acting on this. So we do three things at least when they take off. First time. One, nothing. I didn't do anything. Just notice what happens when you do this. And then we evaluate, does this feel, is there sufficient verisimilitude that you're getting some sort of clinical experience here? We can actually measure this. Two, I'll ask them to make this the worst possible takeoff. We go the other direction. Not the best one, the worst one. Grip the seats, stop breathing or breathe through a straw, hold on tight, have terrible thoughts. They're not going to stay with them, don't worry. And then I ask them, how was that experience compared to the first one? And of course, they're going to say, it was awful. To which I will say, you're the one who did this. You are the one who is making these changes. It's not the plane. You are bringing this to the plane. That's your mental set. And then we do a third one. And this is the one we're going to keep repeating, which is the right way to do this sort of work. The cognitions, the breathing, the behaviors. Does that make sense? Yeah? So we're going to keep them on working in that way. So maybe we can use VR to keep practicing things that we can't ordinarily do. So I want to show you something. This is kind of interesting. We were talking before about mental set. And I think, no, okay. We're having a little bit of problem with the videos. Better than nothing. So let's get to the end now, come to the end of my story, and confront some of the hurdles that we have to confront with VR. Some of the hurdles are to do with we in mental health. We're not flush with cash. If you're in independent practice, you've got to fund it from somewhere that's from your patients. It's expensive compared to doing it with just a piece, of, a piece of paper and use your imagination. This is expensive work. So that's one hurdle requirement. Second one. I found this picture because I want to illustrate to you the concept of interference. Okay? Many psychologists, many in the mental health, think that having equipment in the room, playing with it, is an interference. It comes between me and my patient. It's a third party. I don't want them there. What happens if it falls over? It disrupts the therapeutic alliance. I want to assure assure you, in my 17 years, it goes the other direction if you apply it properly. It enhances and augments your work. It conveys, especially if you've got a young 16-year-old male who's into tech, that you are into tech too. You make, you make that connection. Okay? So it's really quite, quite important. So that's an interference. The other one, of course, is that we don't have bespoke environments. That is, we have to use off-the-shelf environments and hope that it works with our patients. So down the track, the idea will be, can we use newfangled equipment that will allow us to make it just for that person rather than a Procrustean VR method where we, they have to fit into us. Okay, that's the next thing. And then the final thing. Oh, oh. this video is working. We don't want to overuse the technology. Whoa. I think I'm challenging this other guy. He's way ahead of me though. Holy shit. That's awesome. Okay. <laughs> that is awesome. This is one of the problems with VR, that we put people into these environments and they can't interact with them. They're just passive observers. That will take you a certain direction, but if we want to make this go further, they need to be able to act within the environment. And that's where the haptics come into it, being able to touch and feel things will increase that rate of emotion. We're getting that way, I think. So that's the, uh, the Swayze effect. Okay. I'll skip that two one. Bars are exactly the oh, same maybe not. I've got, I've got two it minutes, Brennan. as though my visual system has been totally two minutes. fooled by this Finish illusion. Off. So this is the Muller Lear illusion that, that you saw before, but now it's well, using haptics. Can you tell me so those two bars were the same you know length. Yes, this one looks longer. Fine, okay. But she says that one off the top is longer. We know it's not. fingers are tracked by a special set of cameras as I reach for the bars. Perfect. If my entire visual system has been fooled, then my grasp should be wider for the bar that looks bigger. And open them. And tell me again, are they the same or different? No, this looks bigger. OK. Mm -hmm. So uh, when I say go, pick up the one on the right. Two, one, go. Great. The movements of my fingers reveal a fascinating aspect of the workings of my brain. The bars look different lengths, 
but my fingers shaped to pick them up in exactly the same way for each. Part of my visual system, which is guiding my hand, has not been tricked by the illusion and is acting independently of what I'm consciously seeing. In other words, even though visual is our main organizing system to understand the world, haptics can leap above it. My final words for you if you're working with anxiety patients, teach them about focus, including their uncomfortable symptoms. They will survive them. They're not killers. They're unpleasant. And allow them to stay curious. Anxiety, its antidote is not calmness. That's an artifact. Don't aim for calmness. If they get calm, nice. Help them become curious. A curiosity is an approach phenomenon. Anxiety is an avoidance phenomenon. Help them stay curious. And VR is a wonderful way to help them stay curious, because it's a wonderful technology if you use it appropriately. So, time to hand on the baton to our next speaker. Thank you very much for your attendance.